Okay. Good morning. It's Tuesday, June 15, Math 264 Delta College is our class session. And we're going to start out with a very quick look forward, look backwards into the whole mission of our course. So you could look at the chapters in this book. You could look at the content of our course in kind of an order or a timeline. And not always do you every, do every section in a book and not always do you do every section in a book in order. So this is kind of the order we followed so far. This is kind of our philosophy. And then I'll show you where we're going after this. So I don't know what color to use to separate this. Above that purple line is what we've done, essentially. So chapter one, first order equations, fundamental concepts and tools. So we're just introdu introducing you to the space, showing you some of the tools you were gonna use. Chapter two, first order systems in general. So introducing another level of complication, you know, expanding your view of this space and what you're facing. Chapter three, we turned a corner. So instead of expanding our view, we focused. We focused on a special type of system called a first order linear system. And we were rewarded with this famous classification of two dimensional first order linear systems. You could likewise try classification in other dimensions but you have to understand every time you add a dimension, like if you wanted to do three dimensional first order linear systems, well then you add new dimension, new space for movement. And so I don't know how many cases we could talk about in the three dimensional space. I'm not even sure if anyone has totally examined that. It's kind of a nice thing about math and differential equations and other subjects in general, that there's always new things to explore. But they certainly base some of their work on what we did in two-dimensional space. Most famous three-dimensional system would be the weather, which numerically we've made great progress on. Instead of saying, here's the forecast for today and tomorrow, now when you look at a forecast, you generally see forecast out for you know, three to seven days and three days can be pretty accurate. I think we're a little prejudiced in the Great Lakes because forecasting the weather around the lakes is much more difficult than in some spaces. And the reason why is because the lakes have an effect over the conditions in the atmosphere. Not always easily predictable. But we've limited ourselves to first order linear systems, two dimensional, and we came up with a complete classification. Now, there are several directions we can go in. Well, two principal directions. Section 3.6, which we haven't formally talked about. I'll mention a word about it here at the beginning today. Section 3.6 is an introduction to chapter four, second order linear equations and forced oscillations. So section three, six is like the bridge to chapter four. And that's a really important direction for us. It turns out to be the main direction for us because we're very interested in studying oscillations. We're very interested in studying vibrations in mechanical contexts, in civil engineering context and electrical context, all kinds of things in nature we observe as oscillations or vibrations. And get one power cord connected here, excuse me. But 
we could take another point of view. Having looked at first order systems in chapter two and how large and complicated and diverse they were, with this victory over first order linear systems, we could say, can we use the knowledge of the linear systems to help us make sense of the general systems? And that is chapter five, nonlinear systems. And there's a whole branch of mathematics that deals with such things like this, systems that are more complicated than the fanciest examples. And some of the things you might hear someday are dynamical systems. So systems where there's a lot of different inputs and we cannot possibly describe the whole thing, but maybe locally, or maybe for a short time, we could describe the system. And again, the most famous example of that would be the weather. There's no way we can solve the equations that'll tell us what the weather will be in a month or in two years. Although we badly want to know that, right? I mean, it's not gonna solve climate change we're definitely collecting a lot of data on the climate and weather patterns, right? So the weather is something that's so complicated, we can't solve it analytically, but maybe we can use special knowledge to make good predictions for a short time or in a particular area. You know, we're very good at tracking tornadoes reasonably good at tracking tornadoes. We know the conditions that produce tornadoes. We know when we see these conditions on radar or wind data, say, okay, we're gonna issue a tornado warning for that area. And they can be very specific about that. So our knowledge of systems, should we take it to study more complicated systems or should we take it to study oscillation and vibration? Well, we really can't do both. It's not with the time that's allotted to us. And we have other missions that we have to accomplish. So our main mission is going to be studying oscillation, studying vibration, chapter four and chapter six with a small detour into appendix B because our ultimate goal is a very powerful tool for studying input and output in mechanical or electrical or physical systems called the Laplace transform. That's our big goal for the end of the course. But there's value in the nonlinear systems. There's value in studying more complicated systems. So what we're going to do is give you a tiny peek into chapter five. And that tiny peek is going to consist of sections 5.1 and 5.2. So not all of chapter five, but just a couple sections in chapter five. Then we'll back out, come back, really starting the end of this week, tomorrow, that's the end of the presentations this week, and open up chapter four to talk about forced oscillations. Before we go on this little detour into nonlinear systems today, I want to open the door to the mechanical vibration, the forced oscillations in chapter four. So I'm going to say this and I'm going to show you a handout about section 3.6. You know from chapter two and some of the work in chapter three that I can think of a second order linear equation. Excuse me, I'm gonna move my paper up. Has a first order linear system. So, if I have 
constant coefficients p and q. Maybe this represents the damped harmonic oscillator. Maybe it represents a general equation. Y of zero equals Y naught. V of zero, velocity, equals V naught. There's a system that says and studies exactly the same thing. In that system, after you make a substitution, it's Y prime equals zero, one, minus Q minus P. I'm talking the most basic connection between these two. If we're talking about a special situation like a damped harmonic oscillator, this P is minus B over M, Q is minus K over M. But just in a generic way, if you make the substitution dy dt or y prime equals v, then you can create this first order system from this second order linear equation. Since we understand first order systems totally, that means really we understand second order linear equations totally, but we haven't taken the time to exploit that. So chapter four is about exploiting total control over second order linear equations with constant coefficients. And section three, six was meant to remind you that this is a very solid and complete connection. And so total control over first order linear systems means total control over second order linear equations. In particular, where you have here, a characteristic equation, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Here, via the substitution y equals e to the st that we've performed a couple times, I also have a characteristic equation and special values for s. Instead of a lambda one and a lambda two, the eigenvalues of the system, I have special values S1 and S2 that build solutions to this second order equation. Now I wanna show you a handout, which is how we're gonna pursue chapter four. But first we have to think about how to expand what a damped harmonic oscillator can do for us. So let's think about this equation in the most general sense, let's focus on the damped harmonic oscillator, m y double prime plus b y prime plus k y equals zero. And then I'll draw a contrast with that in a second. So mass, damping coefficient, stiffness of spring, all three of those constants are positive constants and they represent this physical picture where I have a spring, of a given stiffness K attached to a mass of a given quantity M attached to some type of damping device. And in the old days, you call this a dash pod or shock absorber or a air piston perhaps. And this wall, let's say is a fixed wall on both sides so that when I displace this mass, the spring pushes back, the damper tries to take energy out of the system, but these are the only things happening in the problem. Now in a real physical situation, there's always some kind of external input. So let me redraw the problem. with the same spring the same mass the same damper and the same fixed wall 
on the right hand side. But let's say on the left hand side, I allow this wall to move left or right. And I could be grabbing it with my hand and wiggling it. I could be taking a hammer and tapping it. I could be compressing it steadily. I could be pulling it out steadily. I'm adding some external force, some external input to the system. And how do I represent that in my equation? Well, now instead of my double prime plus by prime plus ky equals zero, sum of all forces is zero. This is a totaling of all the forces in the system. Now, if I have an external force or an external action, or external input, let's just call it f of t, changes with time. Now my equation looks like this. So these are both damped, harmonic oscillators. But this is not forced, it's called unforced. And this is called forced. When you add an external input to the system. So section 3.6 reminds you, you have total description of this. And then chapter four is gonna take us to the place where we can describe everything that can happen here, or at least not many things that can happen here, but we're gonna need chapter six to finish it off. So this is the logic that we're doing. And this is the kind of thing you see every day. And of course, every day you don't, but you know, best illustration I can give you is the wings on an airplane. If you've ever sat on an airplane, and let's say that this is the wing right here, this pen, it's not a great illustration, but we'll make do. And let's say you're sitting on the emergency exit seat. Have you ever looked out at the wings on the airplane as they fly? They're wiggling, <laughs> they're vibrating. So you ring the button and you call the flight attendant and say, help, help, the wings are about to fall off, they're vibrating. And the flight attendant comes back and gives you a glass of water and a pill and just say, you know, rest easy, Mr. Redman. It's going to be okay. Well, why are the wings vibrating? Because they're being struck by an external force. The wind, the air pressure, as the plane speeds through the air. The wings are like a damped harmonic oscillator, but it's being given an external input by the atmosphere. Now you might wanna think that's a terrible way to build a plane. I want to build a plane that has, oh, those wings are gonna be tight. Those wings are gonna be solid. They're not gonna move at all. Of course, that plane would be so rigid and so heavy, it would probably be hard to get off the ground. We would probably lack something also in maneuverability or flexibility. So you definitely want to allow some vibration, but you don't want the vibration to get out of control, right? So that's what we want to understand. What does it mean to add an external force to a system, to a mechanical system, to adapt harmonic oscillator? And this is gonna be shown to us in chapter four, and chapter six. But this section 3.6 right here is just reminding you that you have total control over the system and you understand, you know, and what, what did we call this earlier? We called this homogeneous. That means all the input adds up to zero. That was section 1.8 and 1.9. And we called this when there was something not equaling zero non-homogeneous. So 
So now we're going to come back and study mostly this non-homogeneous case. But before I go there, I want to show you a handout before we go and look at these more interesting systems. So if we take a step backwards, you know, pretend the number in front of the y double prime is not zero, so I can divide by that number. And then pretend that P and Q are any real number. We know that we can use this equation, S squared plus PS plus Q equals zero, this characteristic equation in the context of the second order problem to set up two linearly independent solutions. And from our knowledge of systems, we know exactly what can happen when I solve this quadratic equation. I either get two independent roots, or I get one root repeated, or I get complex roots, right? And since this system also describes the second order equation, it's the same thing with the S1 and S2 when I solve this quadratic equation. I could have S1 and S2 be different real numbers. I could have S1 and S2 be equal real numbers, a repeated root, or I could have S1 and S2 be complex conjugates. Alpha plus or minus beta i. And each one of these cases produces a pair of solutions. Now remember in this case where you had repeated real roots, the pair of the solutions had to use an external factor, the T E S one T. If S one and S two are the same, then I'll write S one twice. The T E S T separated the solution E S T and T E S T. So you now have two independent solutions. And I've done some examples of that in chapter one, and I gave you an example of this on your first exam. What is the cost of these two being a solution. You can go back and look at that problem on exam one with new eyes now after we get into chapter four. But to present this idea to you in a kind of a flow chart, I have this handout and I'm gonna share this with you. So first let's look at Make sure I'm looking at the right screen you are. So here we're in week four, handouts. Second order linear equations. That's what we're opening up in section three, six, and we're gonna begin studying in earnest next week. We're also gonna do four, one this week, which opens this up. And so if you click on that handout, I'm not gonna click on it in this window because of the lag time, but I've opened up the handout in front of me on my desktop and I'll share it with you now. What you have right here is a flow chart for solving these second order linear equations. And the lower left part of the flow chart is the part that we've already experienced. And the upper right part of the flow chart is the part that we need to experience in chapter four and chapter six. So if I have an initial value problem, y double prime plus py prime plus qy, but I add a forcing function on the right-hand side, what's the procedure for solving that? Let's take some generic initial conditions, y naught and v naught. Well, first, I'm gonna solve the homogeneous problem. I'm gonna solve the problem as if the f of t was not there. That's the yh solution. And so I do it by creating this quadratic equation, the characteristic equation, finding the solutions, 
either two distinct solutions, one solution repeated or complex conjugates. That's how I wrote them there. And then my YH is just a combination of two independent solutions, two separate basic exponentials or one common exponential separated by a factor of T or oscillation and growth or decay caused by the complex roots. Now that's the YH and that's one part of the answer. We're imitating section 1.8. But how do I deal with this F of T? I need to create a particular solution as we did in section 1.8. I need to create a sample other solution that responds to this input. And that sample other solution, which we call YP, the particular solution, could be basic or it could be complicated. It depends on whether the input is basic or complicated. So if you think about what the function f of t could be, we could kind of go through a continuum. We could kind of go through a scaling, an increasing of complexity. Let's say the function is constant that we're inputting, just a constant value. That is kind of the easiest function of all, apart from the constant value zero. So that would be a first level of input that we need to solve. How about what comes after constant? A line, a parabola, a cubic. What happens if the input is some polynomial function? That would be the next level of complexity. After you've thought about the polynomial functions, what happens if the function that's the input is an exponential function? That's different than any polynomial. There's another level of complexity. And then maybe one more level of complexity here is what happens if it is periodic or sinusoidal, you know, a wave that occurs regularly. So these are four different levels of complexity. I could add another level of complexity when we come to chapter six. But just think of this basically as my work, my search for YP will depend on how complicated F is. So here's the mission that we're going to start. Our goal when we solve for this YP, this is chapter four, is to imitate the input function. And that was the method of undetermined coefficients. So we're gonna pump up the method of undetermined coefficients to second order problems. And we have to look for any interference between the driving function, the input, and the basic solutions to the homogeneous version of the problem. So we're gonna use the method of undetermined coefficients. And then since we've learned that periodic functions, sine and cosine are associated, associated, excuse me, with complex roots to this characteristic equation. We might have to deal with complex numbers when we look at some driving functions. And so there's a technique that's gonna be useful. It's called complexification that kind of helps us organize our work. But Let's say after we've respected all these different levels, after we've thought about constructing the YP, our job will be to identify the correct form of YP. If I use the method of undetermined coefficients, determine those coefficients, determine those coefficients, and then bring that and marry it to YH. So YH plus YP will be the general solution of the problem. Follow the flowchart. Then I can use the initial conditions with Y, differentiate to get Y prime or V, differentiate, find out what the constants K1 and K2 are that I built over here. And that gives me a solution. So I substitute the initial values in to determine the K1 and K2. And that creates the solution to the original problem. It's not a great flow chart, but it was a flow chart. It is a flow chart that we're gonna follow 
in chapter four and chapter six. So this is the preview of chapter four and chapter six before we take this slight detour now into sections five one and five two today and tomorrow. So five one today, we'll look at five two and we'll come back and look at this drawing in section four one for the easiest kinds of Fs tomorrow. So this handout is on our website. It's not so much a procedure as it is a flow chart or a, a description of how we're gonna attack things. I'm gonna put this away now. So you can find that on our website. You can download it if you like. But let's look at nonlinear systems. So this, back to my paper, number paper. Tear it off the pad so I can advance it easily. This is where we are going. In chapters four and six. First, a slight detour in chapter five. Nonlinear systems. I cannot represent them with a matrix universally. This branches off into a field of mathematics called dynamical systems, where things actually can change with time. Notice we've talked about in chapter three, the linear systems had no dependence on time. It was just a matrix times X and Y. Dependence was only on the state of the system. So, and, and this is a strong, nonlinear systems and dynamical systems, a very, very strong motivation for differential equations. You will come back to that possibly in a specialized course you take afterwards, like fluid dynamics. The weather is like fluid dynamics. If you're a mechanical engineering student, you're going to take a course in fluid dynamics and you'll talk about fancier differential equations. Or if you're studying the properties of electric field or magnetic field in the sense that that involves fluid dynamics as well. The fluid there is the electrical field or the magnetic field. So let's go back. I said I would stop writing dx dt and dy dt, but the habit dies hard. And today, dx dt and dy dt serves a small purpose, so I'll keep it around. But be, 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 uh, be flexible that you can express this either way. And when I say x prime and y prime, I'm implying that the independent variable is t. And let's assume that I don't have a linear system, that it's not ax plus by, cx plus dy. Let's assume that I just have some general messed up combinations of x's and y's. How could the linear systems help me. dx dt, dy dt equals ax plus by cx plus dy. So beautifully simple. 
that we might think that they can't be used in any complicated context. But I'm going to show you how we can use this linear system over here to make solid statements about a general system on the left. And I have to take a detour now into Calc 3. So I need to remind you of something, what it means to talk about a function of two variables. Spitting out a third variable, like slope, or just spitting out a third variable, like height. So do you remember in Calculus 3, what you had is three-dimensional space, x, y, and z. And a function of x and y is meant to be for any x and any y in the plane, a height called f of x, y, a z value or height called f of x, y. So if you imagine for any point in the xy plane, a height f of xy, then what you're creating is a surface, a bubble, a mountain. And in calculus three, you studied a particular technique on these surfaces, you say, Oh, let's keep this y value fixed and let the x value slide up and down the axes. That draws a curve on that bubble. Or in the other direction, let's keep the x value fixed and let's slide up and down the y axis. That creates another curve on the bubble. If you want to think of an analogy here, a useful analogy is a mountain covered with snow. And these are two ski trails, the red ski trail and the green ski trail. And you've stood at the top of the mountain, possibly. And you've looked at the red ski trail and the green ski trail, except on the mountain, they color them with black diamonds or green circles. And green circles are meant to be friendly. They call them easy runs. And black diamonds are steep and aggressive. And they say, you know, danger. Don't do this unless you know what you're doing. I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. I can go on the easy ones and the little blue squares, which are meant to be kind of moderate. But the slope of this red curve right here is like the rate of change of this function in the x direction. And not the x dt, but the slope in the x direction is like partial f, partial x. It's the slope in the x direction. It's called a partial derivative. Derivative only looking, slope only looking in that direction. And then likewise, you had a slope in the y direction. I'm probably putting too much into this table or too much into this picture, unless I could zoom in on the picture, which I can't easily do on paper. Partial f, partial y. And these were two different slopes because you acknowledge as you stand on that mountain that if you point your skis one way, the slope might be less steep than if you point your skis the other way. But together, these two slopes made something useful to us, and it was called the tangent plane. So if I think of those two skis, let's say you put one ski in one direction, the other ski in the other direction, and you stood there kind of cross skis, you're kind of setting up a plane that sits on that mountain. And the plane was called a linearization of this function. It's a tangent plane that approximates the values of the mountain. Now, if you're at that point specifically, let's name this point x naught and y naught. If you're at that point x naught and y naught in the plane, then that tangent plane is meant to be a very good approximation of the mountain. It's got the same height as the mountain. 
And if you just deviate slightly from X naught and Y naught, then the difference between the tangent planes values and the mountains values is not significant. Furthermore, if you only differentiate slightly from the X naught Y naught, the slope on your tangent plane in both directions, or really in any direction, that was called the gradient, cannot differ slight, differ very much from the actual slope of the mountain at that point. Now, if you go 100 yards down the mountain on one trail or another, the slope has certainly changed, even 10 yards. But if you just go six inches left or right from that point on the mountain, the slope is probably not appreciably different. So we say that the tangent plane is a linear approximation to this function f of x and y. I only drew one mountain here, but we understand in our system of differential equations, I actually have two mountains. I have a mountain that describes the x rate of change and a mountain that describes the y rate of change. And when I say linear approximation, I mean literally that this tangent plane is built by two lines forming a plane. It's a linear approximation in the sense that all I do to make a new prediction about my height is measure how far I have gone along the trail. I measure the change in X to make a prediction about the change of F while I point on this trail. And I measure the change in Y to make a prediction about the change in F as I go along the green trail. This is the nature of the word linear. I'm literally looking at the slope in the x direction and the slope in the y direction. Okay, how is this physical thing gonna help me? And how does it relate to a linear system? Well, now we're ready to show you and then we can bring in some unbelievable graphics. So I'm gonna make, I wanna keep this on the board for just a second till I make this change. I'm gonna make a variable switch. I'm gonna rewrite this and study a special point on that mountain, on both of these mountains at the same time. I'm gonna look at both the mountains at the same time. And what's a special point for us in differential equations? Special point would be an equilibrium point. An equilibrium point is where the system is not moving but I want to know the behavior of the system a little bit around that equilibrium point. Is it swirling? Is it driving away? Is it being driven in? So the X naught for us is an equilibrium point. So let's say I take this system so I can ditch that other paper. I'm gonna rewrite this slightly. I take the system dy dt, dx dt, f of xy, and g of xy, and I will consider x naught, y naught to be an equilibrium point an equilibrium solution for this first order system. So a lot of setup right now, but then a payoff, a big payoff. So let's make a variable switch. And the most handy, useful, and simple to execute variable switch is a linear variable switch. Let's let u be x minus x naught. And let's let v be y minus y naught. In the end, the names of the variables don't change what's happening in the problem but this is just for the convenience of tracking our changes. So u is the distance from x to the special value x naught, v is the distance from y to the special value y naught, positive or negative, left or right. 
notice, since my independent variable is t, if I differentiate u with respect to t, x naught is constant, derivative of that is zero, but derivative of x with respect to t is dx dt. So this is a special feature of linear variable switch. du dt and dx dt are the same. Likewise, dv dt and dy dt are the same. x naught y under constant, so the derivative with respect to t in both cases is zero. So now we're ready to build this monster, this weapon. It's called, and you might remember this from Calculus 3, but you used it in a different context, the Jacobian. It always, to me, sounds like a Western movie, like with John Wayne or something, the Jacobian. So let's write du dt and dv dt. I think I'm going to have trouble fitting this all in left to right, but we'll give it a shot and we might have to continue a little bit down the page. Now you just acknowledged to me, or I just made you acknowledge, like being voluntold. I voluntold you to acknowledge that du dt is the same as dx dt. And dv dt is the same as dy dt. And dx dt and dy dt in purple is the system I'm studying, f of x comma y and g of x comma y. But this linear substitution cuts both ways. If u is x minus x naught, then I could write x as u plus x naught. I could write y as v plus y naught. So let me insert those into these two functions, f of x naught plus u, u plus x naught, no difference. I'm going to color code this for a short time, just so you can track what we're talking about. But then after a while, of course, the color coding, it's very hard to correctly execute. And why do I want to look at it as u and v instead of x and y? because I want to concentrate on the distance from that equilibrium point. And now I want to use the Calc 3 knowledge, and I won't explain or justify this, but other than this picture right here, I want to use my Calc 3 knowledge to replace the function f and g with an approximation, with the tangent plane approximations. So what I'm going to use without apologizing, without formally reminding you is the formula for tangent plane. It was f of x naught y naught plus partial f partial x at x naught y naught times the change in x and the change in x here is u. Let me write x minus x naught for a second. Uh, see, but then I get into the space problem. Plus the partial f partial y at x naught y naught times the change in y, which was v. Likewise, I do this for g, which is g of x comma naught comma y naught, and then plus partial f or ah partial g partial x x naught y naught times x minus x naught plus partial g partial y x naught y naught y minus y naught. So I'm creating a tangent plane. <coughs> That's how you wrote the tangent plane using 
the slope in the f and x direction and the change in the x and y direction, slope in the x and y direction, and the change in the x and y direction to predict the movement. Now, something is bothering me about what I wrote, and it's probably because it's too scrunched up, but I, I think we're okay, and I think we're gonna go ahead. And this is way too cluttered with this X not Y not stuff. But fortunately, I can get rid of it in a fairly simple way. We're gonna do this, and then we're going to take a break in a moment. So let's remember the top line was du dt. And then we talked for a while. And then I came out with this stuff. The bottom line was dv dt. And then we talked for a while. And I came out with this stuff for g. Tangent plane for f, tangent plane for g essentially. But now I'm going to take advantage of the fact that x not y not is an equilibrium point. What does that mean? F of X not Y not is zero. G of X not Y not is zero. These are literally not there. They both equal zero. Okay, I'll have to stop writing that. Thank goodness I stopped writing that. But now let me rewrite these pieces, not scrunched together. Partial F partial X at X not Y not but I'm gonna change the X minus X naught to be my U. Partial F partial Y, X naught Y naught. And now I'll change the Y minus Y naught to be my V. I'll do the same thing with G. So I'm still, seems like I'm writing a lot. Seems like I'm making a mess and writing too much, but you should see this pattern emerging from the clouds. <coughs> Let's think about it. du dt equals stuff u plus stuff v. dv dt equals stuff u plus stuff v. In fact, this stuff, partial f, partial x, and x not y not is a fixed number. It's a slope in the x direction at that point. Same for g partial with respect to x, f partial with respect to y, f, sorry, g partial with respect to y down here. These things are four numbers. And I'll make one more rewriting of this before we get to actually take it for a test drive. Why don't I think of this pattern? Oh my gosh, A looks just like this. Looks just like this, except I use different letters. AX plus BY, CX plus DY. This could be AU plus BV and CU plus DV. That's matrix multiplication. So du dt dv dt is this matrix times uv, and this matrix is, excuse me, partial f partial x at x not y not, partial f partial y at x not y not, partial g partial x at x not y not, and partial g partial y at x not y not. And this is what you called in calculus three in the context of changing variables in multiple integrals. And that's not what we're doing here, but this is what you called in calculus three, the Jacobian. The matrix that tells you the price you need to pay for changing variables in a multiple integral. Sorry, I gotta keep sliding the paper up and tearing it off the bottom of this pad. Number paper, there. This tangent plane, this double tangent plane approximation 
has turned into, at the point X naught, Y naught, only at that point, has turned into a matrix times a vector, has turned into a linear system. This matrix was called the Jacobian. So now I've created a linear system. U V prime equals, let's abbreviate Jacobian with J, but X naught, Y naught, times U V. But these four things inside the Jacobian are just numbers. And we are experts now at reading these four numbers. What does that mean? At X naught, Y naught, I could read these four numbers and tell you how the original fancy system is behaving. That seems like too much. That seems like, and we're gonna take a break here in a second. So let me just summarize. That seems like, wow, that's way too easy. That's way too much. But remember, all I'm doing is telling you how the system behaves at one special point. If I want to examine four equilibrium solutions to my system, then I'll have to write this matrix, the Jacobian, four times. Well, the derivatives I only write once, but I'll have to insert the four different points. So let me tell you what the Jacobian is. Jacobian is like a microscope and I don't even have a microscope here. A magnifying glass, do I have a magnifying glass here? Not the old style magnifying glass from Sherlock Holmes or anything like that, but maybe I got a little magnifying sheet of paper. This is like a little magnifying sheet of plastic that you can use to examine something. And it's like holding up a magnifying glass to some special point. We've got in a general system, crazy swirling in every different direction at equilibrium point. But the Jacobian is like a magnifying glass. I hold up to that one, I'm trying to position it on my camera. I hold up to that one particular equilibrium point. This is not working very well to examine what's happening at that one particular equilibrium point. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take five for a second and then we'll demo this on a system. This is almost too good to be true. A magnifying glass that lets me do a super zoom on any point to see how the system is behaving at that point. Okay, so let's see. Let's take five here and we're gonna say 106. And we'll come back. I'm gonna mute my microphone so I can stretch my legs. You can do the same. And then we'll take a sample, to show you how this works in action. This is section 5.1.
Okay, let's get back together here and let's execute this on an example or two. So first I want to remind you how we're looking at this. Remember the U and V represent separation from the equilibrium point in the X direction and the Y direction. So when I write this sentence right here, the U and V are just small distance from X naught and Y naught. Then I'm gonna look at the rate of change combination here in the Jacobian to create a matrix to describe what that system looks like near that point. So let's pull out a fancy complicated system and let's take a look. And maybe we'll pick one out of your book in a second, but I want to remind you of a problem you did in chapter two. So this problem was dx dt and dy dt. This was a homework problem, section 2-2, two, two, number 15, alt. It's one of the problems you submitted for homework. So dx dt is sine y and dy dt it's 2x minus x cubed minus y. I'll pull up the actual sheet just to remind you. This is what the problem looked like. And this is what the solution looked like. So I have multiple equilibrium points. Now the red line and the blue line right here, I'm going to expand that so I can see it. Remember the red line was a place where I had no X motion. Remember sine of Y is zero at each multiple of pi. So on those red lines, I have no X motion. I only have vertical motion. I'm not showing any arrows, but I'm saying on those red lines, all action is vertical. On the blue curve, which is a cubic, that was where dy dt is zero. Where dy dt is zero, there's no vertical action, there's only horizontal action. So where the red lines and the blue lines meant, there's no vertical action, there's no horizontal action, there's no movement whatsoever. These are equilibrium points, these black equilibrium points. Uh, Desmos added these two grays for min max, which are not relevant to us right now. So here's a bunch of equilibrium points. Now, where the lines, where the curves, where there's no X motion, the red curves, the curves where there's no Y motion, the blue curve, those are called X null clines and Y null clines. And we've dropped that word a couple times. And that's the subject of section 5.2. That's where we're gonna exploit those. But first, let's just take our microscope to a couple of these points. Let's take our microscope and look really close to the equilibrium at that point. Let's take our microscope and look really close at what's happening at that point. Now in this problem, you were trying to create a phase portrait for these two people. And so this is what you came up with. Excuse me, I gotta turn that off. So you came up with a field of blue arrows with a flow of these red lines and those two points I just circled above are what's happening here. I need to move to a different color, don't I? I don't know what color would be good. How about dark green? What's happening right there and what's happening right there? I think I drew those a little too close for you to see the action. So I'll expand. What's happening in that window? What's happening in that window? Kind of spoke about solutions being absorbed into that point, but now with chapter three, I've got a word for it. That point in the lower window, to me, looks like a spiral sink. Spiraling in and 
being absorbed at that black equilibrium point. Now, what does the upper window look like? Solutions bouncing off that equilibrium point. I didn't have many lines in there. Maybe I could have added more lines, but solutions bouncing off an equilibrium point. What does that sound like? It sounds like a saddle. So can I actually confirm that I have spiral sink action at this point and saddle action at that point? Can I take a super zoom on those two windows? Now, remember, we've already been greatly aided by Mathematica drawing these streamlines, right? What happens if we had just looked at the field? Well, the field itself, even though I see patterns in it, is a little more mysterious, right? Here's that one window where I think I see spiraling in. And here's this other window where I think I see bouncing off. But unless I like add crazy more arrows, and even then maybe the resolution is not good enough, how do I demonstrate that the upper one is a saddle and the lower one is a spiral sink? So you already see the value of what Mathematica did for us when Mathematica gave us these streamlines. Can I confirm this independent of the computer though? Do I need to depend on the computer to make those decisions? Let's go back to our paper and let's invent the Jacobian. So what is the Jacobian? The Jacobian is partial F, partial X, partial F, partial Y, partial G, partial X, partial G, partial Y. And when I take those partials of these two functions, remember this will be the F of X, Y, this will be the G of X, Y. Then the Jacobian for this problem looks like this. Partial F, partial X, zero. Partial F, partial Y, cosine y. Partial g partial x, 2 minus 3x squared. Partial g partial y, negative 1. This is my magnifying glass. But it depends on the x and y I use. So now I need some equilibrium points. So let's say equilibrium point at I can go back to the paper, but I'll just remind you, one of them was at minus root two and zero. And I think I will go back to the paper to remind you that. That's this point right here, minus 1.414 and zero. The other one I truly had to approximate, minus 1.909 and pi. Let's look at 1.414 and zero. Let's look at the square root of two, negative square root of two and zero first. Okay, if I plug these numbers into the Jacobian, minus root two and zero, it's not hard to evaluate in this case, but I get a zero, cosine of y, cosine of zero is one. Now, two minus three x squared, x squared is two, three x squared is six, two minus six is negative four, and this number right here is minus one. So now I'm going to apply my linear systems knowledge. What kind of system is that? Trace minus one, determinant zero minus negative four, lambda squared plus one lambda minus trace plus one lambda plus four. But who wins? t squared or 4d, 4d is 16, t squared is 1, 4d wins. This is a spiral trace negative sink. So I've confirmed that that system is swirling in at that point. Really economically too. Now I could work out the eigenvalues, eigenvectors, but I'm just interested in the behavior. I've confirmed a spiral sink. Now the other number, 
minus 1.909, it's a little harder to calculate with, pi, let's work out the matrix at that point. But I think I'm only approximating here. Well, the zero and the minus one are easy. Cosine of pi, excuse me, move the paper up. Cosine of pi is not a big deal. But what's two minus three times 1.9 squared. So I haven't really pulled out calculators very much. I can pull this out on my computer, but let me just give you an approximate number for that. So uh, minus 1.909 squared. I'm just pulling out my calculator. And then you add three, you get minus 0 0.6443. Now what's that gonna do for me? Now I gotta do trace and determinant, right? Trace is gonna be minus one again. Determinant is going to be what? Negative times negative is positive. So zero minus a positive number. You know what? I don't care. Zero minus a positive number is negative. This is a saddle. I can approximate the number. So zero minus negative one times this, that determinant is about six, four, four, three. But it's negative because I'm saying zero minus a positive number. Remember, be careful about signs. This is a saddle. So now I've confirmed that these two equilibrium points are a spiral sink and a saddle. Well, let's look at this graphically a little bit harder. I talked about taking this image and doing a super zoom on these points. Well, I'm not gonna hold a magnifying glass up to this static image on a piece of paper, but I could look at a closer and closer window in the Mathematica graph, right? So let's do that. Let's share two Mathematica notebooks for you. Now, I've prepped these already, but these are Mathematica notebooks that are on our website. We've been using them. I just had to pre-input these systems for us. So let me go find them. They're over here. Let me see that you and I are looking at the same thing. We appear to be looking at the same thing. I don't think I can make these so much larger and easier to read, but I'll try to do it a little bit. You're having two windows on the board at once. Yeah, that's a distraction. But I had the first order linear systems notebook and the first order systems notebook sitting side by side. And you see in the one on the left, I've already inputted our system sine y and 2x minus x cubed minus y. So let's enter that. Over here on the right, what was the matrix that belonged to, let's say the first point, minus root two and zero? It was zero, one, minus four, minus one. There's that matrix right there. Here's the data from Mathematica on that matrix. Mathematica says, oh, it's got complex roots. So complex roots, decay, we know it's a spiral sink. But I wanna look at the image. Let's set a viewing window about the origin, just minus one to one, minus one to one. Let's focus on the origin. And graph this system. There's the swirling action of this system. Now I turned off the streamlines for a second. I'm just showing you the field. Below, I show you the field plus the streamlines. Uh, maybe I don't want to show you both at once because it's a distraction, but what I could do is separate the field and the streamlines like that. But let's concentrate on the field. 
Now let's go back over to the left and look at this system at the special point minus root two and zero. Notice the one on the right is at zero, zero. I'm focusing in on the center of my microscope, or center of my magnifying glass. But over here, let's input the values square root of two and my end zero. So square root of two, a hundredth of a unit to the left, square root of two, a hundred of a unit to the right. That's the X. Now Y plus a hundredth of a unit and minus a hundredth of a unit. So very close. Zooming in. Graphics, there's a graphic. Now notice on the left, the matrix system window, the pure linear system window, I just drew from minus one to one, minus one to one. But notice on the right, I'm from square root of two minus a hundredth to square root of two plus a hundredth on the horizontal axis and zero plus one hundredth and zero minus one hundredth on the vertical axis. In other words, I took a super zoom on the center point of minus root two. Oh, looks like I set it up at root two. Let's change it to minus root two. I had the same behavior on either side. but I want to make what you see and what I say consistent. So here's a super zoom on minus root two, which is minus 1.414 and stuff. Look at these two field windows side by side. I drew one red intentionally and I drew one blue intentionally. They are the same field. Now only a slight, Somewhere there's an arrow here at the center of this. There's no arrow at the center of this because this is purely focused on that equilibrium point. And here the equilibrium point is an irrational number squared of two. So Mathematica snuck an arrow in really close to that equilibrium point. But do you see this backs up our magnifying glass theory? The linear system on the right is like holding a magnifying glass up to the general system on the left at that special point. The general system, let's say I run this just to remind you from minus three to three. Minus three to three. I'm gonna to have to do a lot of copy paste right here. The whole system at once. Okay, I'm violating somebody's feelings right here. Violating Mathematica's feelings. Let's try it again. Okay, I'm still violating Mathematica's feelings. Oh, okay, I have one too many arguments in there. Let's try it again. The whole system looked like this, but this picture on the right is a super zoom around that point minus 1.4 and zero. I can undo, it'll take me a second of undoing, to go back to the super zoom. There's the super zoom. What about the other point? Stop sharing. Go back here. Let's grab that homework problem again. What about that other point at minus 1.909 and pi? Let's try to do a super zoom on that point. On the paper, our matrix was zero minus one and minus six, four, three, three, minus one. So I'm gonna 
take those things off the paper and put them into my Mathematica notebooks. I got to find them and arrange them. Got it. Now I got to direct my computer to that window. Got it. Now let's put in those numbers right here. This is only an approximation, 6433. Uh, 6443, excuse me. And minus one, got it. What am I talking about there? I should be talking about not. What am I upset about right there? Trace determinant is negative. Oh, I'm missing the minus one right here. My fault. There we go. Now I got something that's got a negative determinant. Now, mathematics only approximating the characteristic equation, the eigenvalues, and the eigenvectors. And I'm not interested in those, but I'm interested in this negative determinant telling me that this is a saddle. So let's view it. Look at the system. and show the field and the streamlines. Yeah, there's saddle action going on in this system. And here are the streamlines, saddle action. Now let's take the original system and do a super zoom around minus 1.909 and pi. That's gonna take a little effort. So I'm gonna replace this with 1.909. 909 and 1.909 and this one's going to be pi plus or minus a hundredth pi plus or minus a hundredth. Let's see if I can copy and paste that stuff. Good and then let's see if I can take my x range Paste it here. My Y range, paste it here. I'm using the computer to back up my hand calculations, which were backing up the computer's original flow calculations. Somehow that seems like circular reference. Don't worry about it right now. Okay. I've got myself an equilibrium that looks like a saddle, but it doesn't look like that space. So we're gonna to have to investigate what we're looking at right there. I seem to be at 1909. I seem to be equally spaced about that point. Uh, am I looking at a wrong number? On the other side, I mean, I wanted these to be exact images of each other. That's the way it should work out. But I must be changing my scale somewhere. Let's look at minus 1.909 plus 100 minus 100 pi plus 100 minus 100. That seems OK. And I copied and pasted, so I have the same numbers here. And I copied and pasted, so I had the same numbers there. Is the minus 1909 the correct number? Let's go back to our homework sheet and look that up. Ah, I see it here, but I have to share it with you. Minus 1.909 and pi. Well, these images should look exactly alike as they did the first time we did this. So I am screwing up with a sign or a digit somewhere. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time looking for that, but let's just look at it for a second to see if we can find it. Side by side, here's my system. System didn't change. You know, what I should do is I should probably look at this red thing because the error could be there too. But first let's scan the system. I'm putting in minus 1.9 and pi. 
the y. That looks good. I'm going plus or minus a hundredth on either side of the equilibrium point. That looks good. Plot range like that. That looks good. 15, 15, that looks good. So the blue picture, I feel better about. In fact, I like the blue picture better than I like the red picture. Now that I come to think about it, looking at the original graph problem, the blue picture is more vertical. And so was that equilibrium point at that point. So that's worth pointing out to you. That takes me a lot of window shifting, sorry. Do you see at this equilibrium point up here, that is kind of vertical action. Sometimes the error is not where you expect it. Sometimes the error is somewhere else. So let's get these back up together. I think this red thing looks wrong. Let's go back and look at my matrix. My matrix could be zero, minus one, goofy number, minus one. Is that right? It should be right. I'm looking at what's on my paper. I'm grabbing that. Did I calculate the 6433 correctly? Let me double check that. Oh, I did it incorrectly. This number is incorrect and that's the problem. I did three minus three X squared. So let's correct this number. So there you go. You hunt for the error until you find it. So let me retype on my calculator, two minus three times minus 1.909 squared. Just to show you my calculator and I'm not focusing on that screen, but I had originally added three instead of adding two. Okay, correct number, minus eight. Nine, three, two, eight, which is minus eight, nine, three, two, eight. That's a big difference in that number. Let's see if it makes a difference in my image. 8.9328. Then let's hope we didn't double our arrow, error. So we come back here, we execute this notebook again. And let's give it a spin. There's the vertical field I wanted. Again, almost essentially exactly the same, except for this little arrow in the center, which it means we're not exactly centered on the equilibrium point. <coughs> Here are the streamlines in that picture. But this is a picture in red of the matrix's linear system. And the picture in blue is a super zoom on the original system at an equilibrium point. Now on the homework, one of the homework problems I want you to do tonight, I want you to produce such a comparison picture. And you can do it as exactly as I've done it, but you have to manipulate these two notebooks. But let me give you a word of warning. So you can use these two notebooks. You have this recording to show you how I did it. But what I have, sorry, I did not have both notebooks shared at the same time. Let's try it again. They're sharing both notebooks at the same time. Now with the corrected entry in that matrix, there's the field matching, it's a perfect match. One stray arrow at the center here, which means we're not exactly centered on the equilibrium point as far as mathematic is concerned. We approximated. So I want you to produce a comparison like this for the homework problem in 5.1 tonight, at least at one point. 
you have to read the problem carefully. But now this is the warning. You can use these two notebooks that I've given you already, but be careful about this, that Mathematica is doing calculations in the background and you have two notebooks open. That means you have a value for F on the left and maybe a value for F on the right. In other words, you're defining variables in two different windows, but Mathematica calls this one session or one kernel one state of the machine. So if you want to produce your images, make sure after you feed it to the machine in these two notebooks, you can have both notebooks open simultaneously, but make sure and execute all the way down one notebook till you get your image and then put in the values, execute, all the way down until you get your image in the other notebook. And as you execute each line, you'll be redefining any variables that match between the two notebooks. Okay. Uh, that shouldn't really stop you, but if you're seeing some crazy thing happen, you can't explain that's a possibility. I could have combined this experiment into one notebook, but I hadn't done that yet. Okay, what else do I want to say about that? So this is a window of plus or minus one one hundredth on the left. It's a window of plus or minus one on the right. And that's what your homework question asks you to give me a sample of. Okay, I'm gonna get out of these notebooks and I'm gonna move to the next idea. And I'll leave those on in the background. I'll move my window over here and we're back to my paper. Okay, so this is one demo. Let's take another demo just as a sample, section 5.1, because we're doing a fair amount on time, that's okay. And I'm gonna pick a problem out of 5.1 just for fun. Let's look at, Twenty to twenty-five is interesting in five point one and five point two. Five point one and five point two kind of go together in a way. So he repeats some of the problems there and asks you to do them in both techniques. But in five point one, let's look at. 15. Let's look at 15 and 5.1. So I can give you a preview of what we're going to do in 5.2. Because the techniques in 5.1 and 5.2 are really used together at the same time. He's just presenting them in two different sections. So this is exercise 5.1. Number 15, and it reappears in 5.2 as well. And now I'm going to use my abbreviated writing x prime y prime x 2 minus x minus y y y minus x. Now let's look at, now, oh, by the way, also in these problems, and I'm gonna slide my book under the camera for a second. Pay special attention to the instructions if they tell you where you should be looking. So, in the problems that I'm gonna do right here, this one I'm about to do, it says, we restrict our attention to the first quadrant. If he says that to you, do not produce images that show me the second, third, and fourth quadrant, don't work in the second, third, and fourth quadrant. 
they only want you to work in the first quadrant. And there's a reason for that, but first let's just follow instructions. But it could be that I don't put this restriction on or the book doesn't put this restriction on. So if they didn't write this, then you're supposed to look in all four quadrants. You're supposed to look at the whole plane. So just pay attention to the instructions, okay? So here they tell us to only look at the first quadrant. So I draw a graph only of the first quadrant. I shouldn't have even drawn this little tail over here. That bothers me because I'm obsessive compulsive. So now I have to put a tail on that one, but I shouldn't put either one. Okay, let's look at this curve in red. Let's look at this equation in red. Let's look at this equation in blue. What are the equilibrium points? Well, you've practiced solving these two equations at once. In fact, I have two factors, two chances to make x prime zero. Either x is zero or x plus y is two. Either y is zero or x equals y. Those are the two ways to make each one true. The equilibrium points come from the combination of looking at those factors. So for example, if x is zero and y is zero, I got an equilibrium point, got it. If x is zero and this factor is zero, that gives me zero, zero again for an equilibrium point. Repeat, don't need it. What about if y is zero and I look at this factor? If y is zero and I look at this factor, x could be two. So there's an equilibrium point, two is zero. Now, what if both of these factors are zero? Forget about these. What if you're on this line and this line? What if x plus y is two to make this zero, but x is equal to y to make this zero? So if x is equal to y, this is two minus two y, which happens if y is one. And if y is one and x is y, then x is one. Okay, I did that too fast, but I have three equilibrium points. Now the preview of section two is to think like this. X equals zero. X equals zero is the vertical axis. Let's color that blue. Y equals zero is the horizontal axis. Let's color that red. I'm gonna ditch that red pen because it run out of ink. Get another one. And what's the zero, zero? Where there's no motion for x prime and no motion for y prime, that's the equilibrium point. What about these other two lines? What about y equals, I did this and I miscolored it, didn't I? x equals zero should be red, y equals zero should be blue. Okay, let's try it again. So I'll slide this color over here. So let's draw x equals zero, which is the vertical axis, y axis. Slide my paper up. Let's draw y equals zero, which is the horizontal axis. And where there's no vertical motion and no horizontal motion, there's no motion. That's the equilibrium point zero, zero. What about these two lines? Let's color this one red. X plus, what if this is equal to zero? That means two minus X minus Y is zero. That means X plus Y is two. So I mark that point. One, two, and I'm coloring it the right color, right? Because I don't want to start over again. There's the line x plus y equals two. And here's the line y equals x in blue. Uh, 
Well, again, where red and blue cross, I have no X motion, no Y motion. That must be an equilibrium point. This must be an equilibrium point. Red and blue lines crossing. This is not an equilibrium point. That's at two, one, one, two. This is not an equilibrium point because there's no X motion on the red line, but there's still Y motion here. Y is two, this will be two times two if X is zero. So only when there's no X motion and no Y motion do I have equilibrium point. Now let's talk about the X motion and Y motion more clearly. Let's look at the red line. X prime is zero on the red line. That means all the action is Y action. So I'm going to make vertical slope lines. What about the blue curve? On the blue curve, there's no Y motion. That means there's only X motion. So I'm gonna make horizontal slope lines. This is a preview of section 5.2, but we're also gonna do our Jacobian on it. Now let's focus on what's happening at 1.1. One, one. I've got horizontal motion, vertical motion. I've got two ideas right here. Am I swirling in or out? in or out, or with these blue and red arrows, am I doing a flyby, a saddle of some type? How am I gonna know? I'm gonna use the Jacobian. Now, I could attach arrowheads to these red and blue things, but now let's use the Jacobian. So remember X prime, I need to multiply it out so I can do my differentiation easier. 2X minus X squared minus XY. Y prime, Y squared minus XY. So now the Jacobian, I'll do this quickly since we're coming to the top of the hour. Partial F, partial X, this is F, this is G. Partial F, partial X is two minus 2x minus y. I squeeze that in too tight, I'll have to rewrite it. Partial f, partial y is just a negative x. Partial y, partial x is a minus y. Partial, uh, partial g, partial x is minus y. Partial g, partial y is 2y minus x. So there's my Jacobian. What's the Jacobian at one, one? Well, that's a kind of a gift. I get to plug in one for every variable. And what do I got? Two minus two minus one, negative one, negative one. And here's two minus one, which is one, right? Make sure I do this right. So now we're gonna answer a question. Is it swirling or is it bouncing off at that point? Now, a computer could already show us the image, right? But I'm doing this work without the machine just to get a feeling for what's happening there. So trace is zero. Oh, now I know what it is. Do you remember your trace determinant plane? And now determinant is negative one, subtract positive one. Negative one, subtract positive one is negative two. Now I really know what it is. Negative determinant is saddle. I guess I was calling it too quickly. I thought trace equals zero was going to be up here in the centerville. I thought I was going to be cycling eternally, not going in or out but that was way too rash. The determinant tells me 
I might be on that vertical axis, but I'm in saddle land. Okay, so what's going on here must be flying by that point. Now I don't have the time to pull this up on the, or don't I? Yeah, we're gonna do it anyway. Let's pull up 2x minus x squared minus xy. Let's see that saddle at that point. Okay, that's the last thing we'll do here. So I'm coming over here. I'm only gonna open up one Mathematica notebook. <coughs> Excuse me. Over here. And let's input the system from the problem. x, 2x minus x squared minus x times y. Uh, be careful, don't say x times y next to each other because that's the name of a variable. Mathematics thinks you're trying to spell out a word for a variable. Either put a space or put an asterisk. And here, y raised to the two minus x times y. Asterisk is safe. Now, I remember I only want to be in the origin, so let's run this uh, minus three to three. Oh, let's run this zero to three. I only want to be in the first quadrant, right? So you have to make manual adjustments. And then I'll get to copy and paste that there. It's no approximation, much shorter. And here I don't get to copy and paste because I have no X in that string. Right, so I have to do zero three and zero three manually. There's my field. And look at that. At one one, it is saddle action. Let's show the streamlines, which we defined above. Streamlines coming in in red. Uh, red and blue, a little bit crazy. Let's get rid of the field. There's the streamlines. There's the saddle at 1-1. One, one. So the Jacobian did predict what was happening at 1-1. One, one. Okay, that's a basic idea, but I also wanted to present that problem to show you the idea of no Y motion on the blue line no X motion on the red line. If I could attach arrows to these, which we'll do tomorrow, I would see the reds going up on the left, down on the right. I would see the blues going left above and right below. And that would be another indication that I'm just bouncing off that point. As I get closer and closer to that point, I'm doomed to bounce off that point. So these red and blue lines right here are called null climbs. I had that word in some previous mathematical notebooks, but we haven't formally discussed it yet, which we'll do next time. Okay, thank you for your attention. If you have a question, let me know. You're doing a couple homework. Well, tonight you have one homework problem you're submitting, but this concept is on the next two problems in section 5.1, plus you get a little second order problem in section 3.6. So send me a question in the email if you don't ask a question, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.